everybody. Let's rise if you're willing and able, and let's sing, enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and come in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and come in. song open your ears to the song today will be a joyful day open your ears to the song open your heart everyone open your heart everyone today will be a joyful day open your heart everyone don't be afraid of some change don't be afraid of some change today will be a joyful day don't be afraid of let's sing and to rejoice To rejoice and come in. Today will be a joyful day. And to rejoice and come in. Good morning. We are going to start our service this morning with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that our church, community, and homes are on our ancestral lands stolen from the Muwekma Ohlone peoples. We acknowledge their ancestral relationship with this land, its plants, animals, and water for millennia and continuing to the present day. We recognize the Ohlone people are still here. In solidarity with all indigenous people and their rights to self-determination and justice, we de decry the historical wrongs done to them and the resulting trauma they have suffered. We commit to being active partners towards the healing of native people's inter intergenerational and ongoing harms. Hello again. My name is Barbara North, and I am currently serving as the board of the uh, board president of the, your board of trustees. <laughs> we are glad to welcome you to be with us this morning. We are an intentionally multi generational, multi racial, multicultural, inclusive an anti-oppressive religious community, and you are welcome here. If it's your first time joining us today, we invite you to fill out the guest connection card, which you can find out at the welcome table, or there will be a link in the Zoom. And we'll be in touch to help you learn more about what's going on in our community. Uh, also, after the worship service today, several people will be meeting out front on the, the plaza here uh, to find a casual place for lunch following the service. Everyone is welcome to join that, um, to, to find some good company and find some good food. Jeff Melcher will also be meeting people out front of the church at that time to do a quick tour of the building for anyone who's new to the building or would, hasn't been here for a while and would like a little refresher about the building. Uh, Speaking of Jeff Melcher, he has started in his new position as Director of Religious Education and has shared some timely information about children and family programming in the past week's Chalice Chatter. Be sure to check out uh, RE News, that is R-E-N-U-U-Z, which is the Religious Education News section, to read about the rest of the summer and what's coming in the new program year, such as Children's Trapper, Our Whole Lives Sexual Education, and job openings. You can also reach Jeff at jeffrey at uuoakland.org. That's with a J, Jeffrey with a J. I also invite you very briefly, if you want to get out your smartphones to save the date, we're having an all-church end-of-summer picnic on Sunday, August 28th. 
This will be at Lowell Park, which is just down the street across the bridge here, at 1180 14th Street. Bring your family and friends a picnic lunch, musical instruments, a game, a blanket, and your favorite picnic accoutrement. Thank you. We signal the start of our worship service by lighting our sacred flames. I invite Libby Kroll and Haley Kroll to do the honors. Thank you. May these flames shine on your paths to elderhood. We light our peace candle as we try to make meaning of our history and to help us work for peace and justice each day. We gather to rekindle our source of hope for a better tomorrow by recognizing our shared humanity in one another. We gather today because it is through community that we can accomplish this holy work. Please join me in the following words. We light this candle today as a And with the words and gestures taught to the children of First Unitarian, we light this chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. May it remind us of the divine spark in all of creation, the power of love to heal what is broken, and to be grateful for life's blessings each day. In one voice, let us, the people, say, come, let us worship together. In a moment, we will greet one another. In our physical space, remember we are still in a pandemic, so please observe safe distance and practice confirming consent to touch. In virtual space, please feel free to unmute your microphones or use chat. With gratitude for this community, let us welcome each other to church this morning.
It's so great to be together. I invite you to return to your seats. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dick Bailey, and I go to church here. And I'm old. They say that growing old is not for sissies. Friends, on behalf of my fellow sissies, do us a favor. Please eliminate those words from your vocabularies. This service has had four iterations. You're getting the third. You'd be getting the fourth if some bozo hadn't closed the program before he saved his work. Word Processing 101. Just as well, because if we had the fourth iteration, we'd be doing coffee hour for a midnight snack today. <laughs> the first iteration. Since we started the summer and with a late-led coming-of-age service, I thought we'd end the summer with a going-of-age service. A service based upon the lived experiences of our elders. So I sent out a bunch of inquiries to a lot of folks over 70 and got all kinds of ideas about what folks had learned during their life journeys. However, when I sat down to synthesize their myriad wonderful responses into a coherent, ultra-wise swan song of a homily, proved too daunting. Quite honestly, it was too much for me to do at this point. The second iteration. I switched gears and decided to ask a handful of elders to tell their stories and came up with a list of names. But alas, except for gender, they all looked like me. Scary over 70, and white. In defiance of our mission statement, here I was crafting a one generation, one race, one culture, non-inclusive worship service, which by definition would be oppressive. What a doofus. The most important word in our mission I'm easily confused. <laughs> the most important word in our mission statement is intentionally, because it modifies each of the adjectives which follow, except perhaps religious. So for the third iteration, I asked the always wonderful, forever young Noemi de Guzman to be worship associate, and she said yes. Then I lowered the age limit below 70, and who shows up but Donna Fujioka? And she said yes. And then I realized that Betty Bobo Seiden had never received my initial emails inviting elders to participate because, not paying attention, I had sent it to the wrong email address. I called her up, and she graciously said yes. 
Finally, Helen Duffy's initial response was fabulous, but I know that she and Bill spent each weekend up in Ukiah helping Bill's mom, and I really wanted this service to be one in which all of the presenters were live and in person for you folks who were able to show up live and in person. And out of the blue, she contacts me, and Helen says that she's changed her plans, and she could be with us this morning. And that, good people, is how the sausage was made. <laughs> Here are the questions that I asked the presenters to consider for an elder service entitled Looking Back and Looking Forward. Looking back, pretend that you at your present age are writing a letter to yourself as a youth. Give your young self some tips about what you've learned over the course of your adulthood. Maybe consider what did you worry about that didn't turn out to be as important as you thought it would? And what do you wish you had paid more attention to earlier on? Looking forward, while we don't know how much time we have left, we do have a modicum of control over who we are and what we do during that time. What is your intention over the rest of your days? What might you want to clean up rectify, make better? Is there something else you want to accomplish? What can you leave undone? Answering these questions involves choices, and choices generally involve trade-offs. You choose one thing, you don't get another, despite those who want it all now. For example, Sherry Larson Beville told me that how she always realized that, how she always wished that she had gone to college right after high school instead of getting married and raising a family. And then in her next breath, she said, but my family is the most important thing in my life. Choices and trade-offs. And let's be honest, a lot of folks don't have opportunities for real choice. And the questions that I have posed are irrelevant to many. If you're one of the over one-third of a billion people on this planet on the brink of starvation today, your choices are virtually non-existent. Similarly, for the 90 million folks who have been forced to leave their homes because of war, or for folks who are incarcerated, or living on the street, or for those forced to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term, and on and on. The questions given the presenters that I had hoped would resonate with you all, were posed by someone who had rarely, if ever, had to worry about shelter or safety or having something to put in his stomach. They scream privilege and are irrelevant to lots and lots of good people who deserve the opportunity to make choices, equ equitable choices, based upon possibility rather than desperation, abundance rather than scarcity. Contrary to the popular myth, there is enough to go around. Were we the already privileged and powerful to have the will to make it so. Thank you for your consideration. Please rise in body and spirit and join our wonderful Stefan Schneider in returning again to the land of your soul. Return. Re
return again, return to the land of your soul, return again. Return to who we are, return to what we are, return to where you are, born and reborn again, return, Hi, I'm Donna. As I pondered Dick's assignment, I concluded that I don't have anything very profound to say. And even if I did, I doubt my younger self would have listened. <laughs> oh, I might have looked as though I were paying rap attention, I developed that facade over many years of schooling. But really, I think most listeners will be others my age, or at least other baby boomers, who want to compare their thoughts with mine. Sixty-nine trips around the sun has given me perspective. I don't think that's the same thing as wisdom. It's also made me cynical and less idealistic. I definitely believe that I know less now than I was sure I knew as a youth and young adult. I used to think progress was, well, progress and not the pendulum swing we've been experiencing. Roe v. Wade was a done deal, right? Surprise! I went to school during the Cold War and mostly preceded the various liberation movements. I did not recognize that the purpose of public education is not to educate or teach history, but to socialize the next generation to support the status quo, i.e., in those days, it was the hegemony of the military-industrial complex. The so-called education I received in the 50s and early 60s, the good old days to some Republicans, is what will be foisted on children in too many states. I can imagine many repeats of what my mom experienced in the 60s when she was a guest speaker in classes for teachers renewing their credentials. My mom would recount her experience 
at Thule Lake, one of America's World War II concentration camps. Inevitably, at least one person per lecture would challenge her lived experience and say, it didn't happen. Gaslighting of history and denial of non-dominant people's lived experiences is in our future. Of course, there's all those things I took for granted way back when. Who thought that rights once given could be taken away? Starry decisis, let's blow up that law school concept. Decent teeth, who knew that fillings and crowns don't last forever and that mouths go to hell once the good dental insurance is gone? And health in general, another underappreciated part of living or not living. But one thing I'm proud of, when I was in my 20s and a low-paid research associate, I participated for a year or two in a pension plan that had a little bit of matching. That $3,000 I put in is now a good 105,000, or at least it was before the stock market crashed. A lesson in the time value of money. Like my dad, I will not dwell on the past and find, and find what ifs and I wish I had not very constructive. As to looking forward, I want to make this earth a better place than when I entered, given all the resources I have and will consume. What would that look like? It means clearing out a ton of stuff from my house so that my daughter is not left with a huge mess my mother left behind for me. In the larger picture, I want to continue to grow, learn, explore, and contemplate new ideas, concepts, and paradigms, and revisit old ones. Such learning and insights come from many sources not the least of which is from youth and young adults. Thank you. The following reading has been adapted from a poem by Brazilian poet Mario de Andrade, the title of which has been variously translated from the Portuguese as The Valuable Time of, of Maturity, or My Soul is in a Hurry, and inexplicably, My Soul has a Hat. I've counted my years and found that I have less time to live going forward than I have lived until now. I have more past than future. I feel like the boy who received a bowl of candies, the first ones he ate ungraciously in a hurry. But when he realized that there are only a few left, he slowed down and began to savor them intensely. I no longer have time for endless meetings where rules, procedures, internal regulations are discussed, where people do not discuss content, only labels. My time has become too scarce to discuss labels. I want the essence my soul is in a hurry. Not many candies are left in the bowl. I want to live next to human people, very human, who know how to laugh at their own stumbles and who are not inflated by their triumphs. People 
who do not run away from their responsibilities. People who, are, who defend human dignity and only want to walk on the side of truth and honesty. This is the essence that makes life worthwhile. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch hearts, people who have been taught by the hard blows of life to grow through gentle touches of the soul. My goal is to reach the end satisfied and at peace with my loved ones and my conscience. I hope that is your goal too, because either way, you will get there too. We all have two lives, and the second begins when you realize you only have one. Mario DeAndretti. In a bit, I'll sound our singing bowl as an invitation to you to join in a practice of embracing meditation. For now, I invite you to take a few breaths and take a pause and be present with the joys and sorrows of this life. Please send healing energy to Kelly Kirkpatrick who was struck by a van last Monday as she crossed the street. While she is still in, in intensive care, her partner Peter Fisk reports that she is gratefully now out of the woods. I invite those here in Hamilton Hall to speak your cares and concerns aloud. In our virtual sanctuary on Zoom and Twitch, Please unmute your microphone or use the chat as you are able. An embracing meditation. Please breathe in all that has been shared. And as you breathe out, join me in saying, we hold them in our care. Please remain seated and we will all sing together in one voice our pastoral prayer. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, O oh my soul. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me. Sing with me, 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Helen Duffy, and uh, this is my reflection. Dick gave us some questions to consider. One of them was, what do you know now that you are glad you didn't know when you were 20? At first, I thought this was an easy answer for me, nothing because knowledge is power, and I always want more power. Um, 20 is too old to be as ignorant as I was then. Yet, the innocence of my generation's childhood and, something, and the sometimes willful ignorance of our parents' generation set up a shocking contradiction that outraged us when we came of age. So perhaps there is some value in allowing at least very young children to believe in a world where most everyone takes care, it, it, where most everyone cares for and helps each other. When I was about 16, I found it unbelievable that the United States would drop bombs on peasant villages in Vietnam and Cambodia. That set off a shock that shaped me and many in my generation because until then or later, I still didn't know some critical truths about our country and its government. I still had to learn, for example, that our, go that our government had always been in the hands of business and that it was rooted in racial capitalism, that it invaded other countries dozens and dozens of times in Latin America, Asia, and elsewhere to impose dictatorial governments and advance U.S. interests, causing tremendous misery as it did so in the name of building democracy. Uh, I still had to learn that our government used illegal activities to repress dissent and cause the deaths of its critics both here and abroad. Now, what do I wish I knew then that I only learned later? Well, maybe you can guess some of these things from this advice I wrote to my younger self. Listen, Helen, you are so earnest and energetic. Your love for the world and for its people, your love of knowledge, it's a great place to start, and I have confidence in you. However, please consider these things I've learned over the years since about 1970. If you want to have an interesting life, you need to take a deep breath and wade into unfamiliar territory and stay there with an open heart long enough to relax and learn and contribute. At some point, you will need a place to call home, but try not to sink everything into it. Before you settle down, travel somewhere really different and live out of a suitcase for three months. 
Let that cure you from accumulating things you don't need. And let that teach you things I can't even begin to count. The Beatles said, love is all you need. I'd say no, it's not. But when you don't know how to respond to a problem, love is an excellent place to start. Now, here's some more advice. Don't expect people to be like you or to to approach life with the same motivations or hold the same values or have the same definitions of those values. Now, Helen, dating is an area where you really need some advice. (laughs) And uh, so I don't want you to dismiss this without sitting with it for a while. Don't assume that people you date have your best interests at heart. You can be nice. You should be honest and caring. But don't make your lover's needs more important than your own. You may be just perfect for them and they can still be just wrong for you. You will make mistakes in dating. Take care about dating people with substance problems or people who tell wonderful stories because they are complete narcissists. On choosing a mate, look for kindness, shared values, and ability to give the partnership an important place in their goals, a desire to listen to you and honor you and your ideas about what you need. Nurture your friendships. Forgive lapses and silences. If friendship is important, if if a friendship is important to you, just try again and stay in touch. You may still lose some important friendships, but an easygoing, forgiving attitude can sometimes save one that is worthwhile. Here's a really important one. Stay away from cigarettes. Uh, If you don't, you will probably suffer horrible bouts of self-recrimination year after year, trying to stop smoking dozens of times before it sticks. Nothing you get from cigarettes is ever worth that. Don't shirk from competition. Don't shirk from friendships with people who who you perceive to be superior. In fact, try to get over feeling inferior and approach friendships with a generous and confident spirit. Learn to enjoy working hard and challenging yourself. Feel proud about what you do if it is an honest livelihood doing something that needs doing. You will be known by your accomplishments, not how hard you work. In fact, sometimes working too hard just makes you look pathetic. Save time for the art, the music, the travel, and the people that make you feel alive. And remember, there have always been people, patriots, who fix things that are wrong in society. Find work in league with these people, and if one can value that companionship and take the work forward, that can bring fulfillment, purpose, and something like happiness. But I return finally to If you want an interesting life, you need to take a deep breath and wade into unfamiliar territory and stay there with an open heart to learn and contribute. Thank you. Good morning. morning. It is so good to see so many of you here this morning.
My favorite holiday is the Day of the Dead. I was introduced to it at the Mu Oakland Museum of California when they produced a, an exhibition of ofrendas, altars created in homes and churches to commemorate the departed ancestors. And it would always include photos, candles, and skulls or skeletons and marigolds. The Pixar movie Coco depicted, it was all about the days of the dead. A young boy who wants to be a musician is not allowed to do so. His family expects him to be a shoemaker. In what looks like a dream sequence, he visits the land of the dead, where someone told him that you cannot be really dead until there's no one left in the world who remembers you. Our memories have to be passed down by those who know us in life in the stories they tell about us. To my ancestors, I would like to dedicate this song. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up. Could we give it up for these people, please? Just a bit about the power of encouragement, both individually and collectively. I would like to lift up two phenomenal people in that regard. The woman on the left is Judith Hunt, with us together this morning on Zoom while isolating at Lake Park with COVID. For many years, Judith traveled from Petaluma to church and back several times a week to, to serve this congregation. Judith tells a story that as a young person, she was quite shy, but was emboldened to talk by a few people who saw past her shyness and took the time to encourage her. Now, I've known Judith for nearly 30 years, and quite frankly, the word shy never crossed my mind with regards to her. 
but that just proves the power of encouragement. The woman on the right is the late Marianne Haw, founder of our Pastoral Associates program. After we served together, along with Judith actually, on a ministerial search committee over 20 years ago, Marianne asked me what I was going to do next. I told her I thought I would go back to being a pastoral associate. And although that program was so very dear to her heart, she encouraged me to apply to be a worship associate. And I'm so very, very grateful that she did. At its foundation, this Unitarian Universalist thing believes that we are all ministers. We all have incredible abundance of gifts to share with one another and this world. Our congregation is in great need of your encouragement at this time. Please consider becoming more involved in the possibilities of our church's shared ministry. Your gifts of time, of your immense talents, and indeed of your treasure are essential to sustaining and nurturing this congregation. I assure you the rewards both to you personally and to the church community at large will be returned many times over. On the screen, you can see numerous ways to give financially at First Oakland. Indeed, when you think about it, there are far more ways to give than there are not to give. Just saying. Will the ushers please come forward? Please join me in saying the words of our congregational commitment that were crafted by the Reverend, the late Reverend Rob L. Isaacs. To the work of the church, to weaving a tapestry of love we call community, 
dedicating ourselves and these are offerings. As a benediction, we're going to do together something we usually do as a responsive reading, but it has much more powerful if we all say all the words. It's, we need one another, crafted by the Reverend George E. O'Dell. Please join me. We need one another when we mourn and want comfort. We need one another when we are in trouble and are afraid. We need one another when we are in despair, temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we strive to accomplish some great purpose and realize we cannot do it alone. We need one another in the hour of success when we look for someone to share our triumph. We need one another in the hour of defeat when with courage, encouragement we try to endure and stand again. We need one another when we come to die and seek gentle hands to prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need and others are in need of us. Thank you so much. Be you in here in person or on Twitch or on Zoom, thank you for being here today. If you're on Zoom, you can stay for the coffee hour. If you're in person, Heather McLeod wants to take you to lunch today. Uh, you can join her right outside. But thank you all. Um, There's going to be a building tour that Jeff Melcher is doing. Is he here? Okay, he's outside. He's going to do a building tour, and then we're going to meet on the steps. And there's a place called Overstory that Leslie told me about. It's a worker-led um, uh, restaurant. It's at 528 8th Street. So you go over to 8th Street, and it's down between Washington and Clay. It's on my hand if you need it. Um, so we'll meet at the steps and go over there. They have kind of modestly priced meals around $15. And then they also have one of those community offerings where, you know, whatever you can pay, they have a real basic meal. Thank you all. Thank for everybody who made this worship possible today. Go now in peace, return in love, and take it away, Mr. Wilk.